I'm very excited to introduce our keynote, Zahir Ali. As an oral historian, Zahir Ali is committed to leveraging the power of storytelling for social change. He is history editor at Sapello Square, an online resource on Black Muslims in the US. He's also the 2020 and 2021 Open Society Foundation Soros Equality Fellow and a Pillars Fund Muslim Narrative Change Fellow. Previously, he directed Brooklyn Historical Society's award-winning Muslims in Brooklyn Public History and Arts Project, which we, um, we were able to profile Zahir in our work on Muslims in New York, which was very exciting, and was a lead researcher for Manning Marable's Pulitzer Prize winning biography on Malcolm X. Zahir is also a member of the ISPU Working Group on Black Muslim Research. And with no further delay, I give you Zahir Ali. Thank you so much. Um, let me do the technical thing here of sharing. All right, so there's that. Apologies, there's a bunch of windows you got to always have. Um, okay. So um, first, I just want to make sure everyone can see the slide. Uh, so thumbs up or a plus sign in the chat box would be helpful. Um, can everyone see the slide? Yeah. Yes. OK, great. All right, thank you. So um, <laughs> Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Um, bismillah. Um, this is a really challenging presentation for me to give because um, there are so many people in this convening whose work I have followed very closely, so many of you that I know, so many people whose work I respect deeply, and I'm like, I, what do I have to say to these people? Um, so I'm a little bit um, without words, but, but I thought what I could do is um, share some of the things that I have learned based on my experience as an oral historian doing doing this work. Um, I, um, you know, did graduate work at Columbia University. Uh, I went as far as the MPhils. I don't have a PhD. I have sort of one foot in the academy, one foot outside. Um, my work has been mostly in the, re in the field of public history and so publicly engaged community-centered work. Um, and so that is the space that I am approaching this subject matter with. Um, and I'd like to start with this quote from Toni Morrison, a speech that she gave um, uh, in, um, in May 30th, 1975 at Portland State University. This speech has made its rounds. Many people are familiar with it, um, but I'm just gonna read it anyway. Um, know the function, the very serious function of racism, which is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again, your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language, so you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says that you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says that you have no kingdoms, and so you dredge that up. None of that is necessary. There will always be one more thing. And I thought about this because we are approaching the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And so much has happened in the last 20 years where Muslims have had to um, address 9-11. And in fact, um, in some ways we've seized the moment and in some ways I think we've been captured by the moment. Um, you know, without a doubt, uh, this brought great opportunities, I think. Um, in, you know, after 9-11, new lines were opened up in departmental searches for professors, new scholarly research uh, funding opportunities, book publishing opportunities, um, you know, study groups, media attention. And so, you know, unfortunately, this is the nature of the marketplace, right? Uh, it is driven by media interest. And you, I, we can, we can best, um, you know, anticipate that as September rolls around, there will be another opening for people to, you know, tell uh, more about these stories. And so, you know, the the challenge with this, though, and 
and, and illustrated by the Toni Morrison quote is that, um, you know, you spend 20 years, we've spent 20 years trying to explain, trying to translate, trying to correct, trying to counter. Um, have we really had, have, you know, there's always one more thing. And so thinking about how we move forward, I was drawn to a framework established by the late Manning Marable, my former mentor, who talked about the Black intellectual tradition in three ways as serving three functions. The first is the corrective, that Black studies or African-American studies was corrective. It, it focused on correcting past stereotypes, um, you know, providing correct information, countering uh, incorrect narratives. Um, the, the challenge with being corrective or coming from a corrective perspective all the time is that um, it puts you on the defensive. Um, and you are always framing your response in the context of what um, has been laid out for you in terms of the parameters. Um, so then the other way that this tradition has worked, you know, is descriptive. So we've moved on from, you know, correcting the misinformation about us from the past. And then we now are talking about life as it really is for us, right? Described in our own words. Um, but, you know, the truth of the matter is um, the data or knowledge um, is structured and structures, right? Um, the knowledge that we present is fashioned according to whether it's our theories or our understanding or the questions we ask. And then that knowledge has influence in shaping perception. Um, so I consider both corrective and descriptive work forms of translation. This is translating um, Muslim life to people who are unaware or not knowledgeable, who need correct information. And what I would like for us to think about is this third bucket, which is prescriptive. And in this bucket, this is where the tradition is focused on providing solutions. And for me, I go a little bit further than just providing um, solutions and thinking about transformation. What, you know, where have we allotted space to imagine what our society should be like? And what are our freedom dreams? And what are our traditions, how, what are the, what are the uh, traditions within our communities? What are the histories within our communities? What is the data from within our communities that can help us fashion and shape a transformative vision for the future? A vision uh, that is not captivated to having to correct misconceptions about us, a vision that is not um, you know, anchored um, solely by having to, you know, inform people descriptively who we are. And so that I, is what I would like for us for the short time that I have um, for us to, to focus on. Um, you know, what, if, if we didn't have to correct, if we didn't have to describe, you know, if we had time and opportunity, what would we able, what would we do to imagine um, a transformative vision for our society. Now, I say that to, to not dismiss the importance of corrective work or the importance of descriptive or documentary work. Um, I've done that work too. I know that later um, in today's convening, there's a whole panel on Islamophobia. This is really important for us to counter Islamophobia, but I, I, I want us to be able to set aside space and time in the work that we do to imagine, um, you know, other kinds of ideals. So I come at this um, as an oral historian. And one of my favorite quotes um, in the field of oral history comes from Alessandra Portelli, who is, you know, considered, I, I, I don't say the godfather of the field because oral history, of course, has been around for millennia. But in the formal academic sense of the field, he is one of the leading lights. And he has this quote where he said, the essential art of the oral historian is the art of listening. And so for me, how we go about accessing that vision or those visions for our society, those freedom dreams, is through the discipline and practice of listening. 
Now, when I talk about listening, what I mean is listening to do three things, listening to learn information, listening to create opportunity, and listening to build relationships. And so oral history um, for me is um, a source, right? So people conduct oral histories to get information, to learn about the past, to learn about people's past, to learn about how people experience and remember and interpret their past. Um, but oral history is not just data. It's not just knowledge. Oral history is a methodology. It is a practice of um, creating opportunity for people to tell their stories. Um, and this is really important when we think about our work as scholars or as researchers, how are we facilitating the um, opportunities for people in our communities to contribute their life experiences, their lived experiences, their histories um, to become part of our analysis. And so it's really important for us to do that um, and to you know, create space because this also includes sitting with stories that are not our own. Um, you know, sometimes people think they're listening, but they're listening to respond or they're listening for you know, to find themselves, you know, they're listening in a kind of narcissistic way of, you know, I'm looking for myself in somebody else's story, or they're listening with a preconceived template or a preconceived container that's formed by their theoretical framework. They're looking for evidence that will support their argument. Um, listening is none of those things. Listening, that's, that's, that's research. Listening is creating space um, with as few parameters as possible that would uh, allow people to tell their story. And why is that important? Well, number one, it's important because you don't wanna foreclose discovering something because you're not looking for it. And sometimes our questions can foreclose possibilities. And again, remember, I'm thinking about that third bucket of prescriptive or imaginative. What can we um, do to create space for us to imagine new possibilities? Um, the third uh, important thing that listening does and that oral history does is it doesn't just provide information. It doesn't just create opportunity. Um, and build people's capacity to tell their stories, but it is an ethical practice. Um, listening builds relationships, listening builds trust, listening builds accountability. And coming out of this, um, the basic premise that I come out of this is that one, everyone has a history, everyone makes history. Um, and that's really important because I think sometimes as um, researchers or as scholars, we find ourselves in the position of having to um, interpret the past for other people. Um, and we use, even when we approach oral histories or we approach sources or we approach data, um, we treat people as data points. And what I really want us to think about is that when we talk to people, at least for me as an oral historian, when I talk to people, I'm not just talking to people to get their information. I'm also talking to people to get their interpretation, right? So it's not just um, documentary evidence, it's also interpretive framework that people have the capacity to tell their story. And then finally, every story deserves to be not just heard, but to be listened to and in uh, by and in community. And so it's really important to situate this work in community. It's important because um, there is a kind of concern that I think a lot of us have um, with making sure our work um, is representative, right? Um, making sure our data sets are representative. Um, and I think we've moved beyond a kind of tokenistic representation to the questions of authenticity. You know, not only is this representative, but is this authentic to the experience? 
is this authentic to the community? Is this authentic to the history? And moving, I'd like for us to move beyond that and think about intimacy, not just representation, not just authenticity, but intimate knowledge and knowledge that is gained from being in relationship with people, right? That's really important, like I said, with oral history, because you're you have to develop relationships of trust in order to facilitate people telling you their story. But <laughs> these relationships are important because they um, provide a kind of accountability. They provide a kind of um, way that we we answer to people, and they answer to us. Like these, we're in relationship with these people. That our work is not extractive. And so, you know, this doesn't mean that we can't work in different settings or different ways. Um, but what it does mean is that when we think about transformative work, um, that work to me, and, and I think when we think about our research, that it should be community-based, that it should be participatory, that it should be dialogic and intersubjective. So community-based, I think we know what that means. Um, and for me, it's really important that, you know, later in this talk that Toni Morrison gave, you know, she sits down for a conversation and, um, you know, while we like that, I like that passage that I quoted, but she, she talks about who she writes for and she talks about how writers, she's just like, you know, and I think she names like Richard Wright. She was like, Richard Wright was not writing for me. Richard Wright was writing for white people, right? Um, so there's this like question of audience and she's just like, I, I'm not interested in that. Like if you're writing for the New York Times, if you're writing for a prize committee, she was like, no, no, I'm not interested in that. Write for me, right? And what she meant was, she was saying like, write for people in the community who might not even read your book, right? Who might not even read your research, right? Because that will be authentic. Right, and that's why to me it's important to be community based um, to have relationships with community when we do our work and it doesn't limit our audience because she goes on to say she's you know. But we're universal our experiences are universal, so when you write for me you're actually writing for everyone else right but it's more authentic than a contrived approach where you're trying to market yourself to a specific audience. So for me, transformative work, work that allows us to imagine, you know, new freedom dreams is rooted in our community. It is participatory. Are there ways that we can involve the community in the gathering of information? Are there ways that we can involve the community in the interpretation of that information? Are there ways that we can speak with members of the community, con you know, continually in a dialogue about what we're understanding, just to make sure we get the story right. And then finally, intersubjective. Um, and I know that various fields have their disciplinary views of what subjectivity is. Oral history basically says, look, there are two people in an oral history interview, and that interview is shaped as much as it is by the narrator as it is by the interviewer. If I did an oral history interview with Dahlia and then say Kalia came along and did an oral history interview with Dahlia, those two interviews might overlap, but they would be different because they are the result of two people with two perspectives shaping that conversation. All of our research, all of the work that we do um, is the result of our location, of our context. You know, when Dahlia opened yesterday, she talked about the anniversary of George Floyd. She talked about what was going on in Palestine. And, you know, we have, most of us have been working in the shadow of 9-11 and surveillance, like all of that informs our work, our context. So um, I wanted to close with an example of work that I did for the Muslims in Brooklyn project. And, and again, this was for Brooklyn Historical Society, which is now called the Center for um, Brooklyn History. Um, so I'm not saying you can't work with institutions. I was, I was at the institution <laughs> as their oral historian. So I'm not, I'm not calling for us to silo ourselves or our work. But it was really important for this project to engage the community 
Um, and again, like I said, with oral history, I, you know, you not, you don't just go to people to get their information, but you go to people to engage their interpretation of that information. So I'd like to play a clip. And, um, you know, this is, I just need to make sure I did enable sound. Okay, I did. Um, so I'd like to play a clip and, and this is, um, this, oops, sorry, wrong slide. Here we go. Um, this is a Dr. Suad Abdul Kabir, who most of you know. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of cheating a little bit because Dr. Suad is, is both a scholar and a narrator in the community. So she has that capacity to both, um, remember um, her experience and interpret it. Um, but what I like about this is, be, is that she actually leans into her subjective experience. She leans into her location in the community. And, you know, um, and, and so Suad signed the release form. So she's completely fine. This complete interview is archived online at Brooklyn Historical Society. I'm not, I'm not spilling anybody's tea. But I will say afterwards, you know, I, so I was a little bit apprehensive about doing this interview because of, you know, so much of her work is already public and it's, it's fashioned in an academic sense and it's very polished and it's very controlled. Like most of us who are scholars are like, this is how we want our work to come across. And because of the relationship, here's that intimacy, because of the relationship I had with Suad, and I not just with Suad, but the relationship I cultivated with these narrators, um, so I got very comfortable talking about her life. Um, but that's what makes this authentic, and that's what makes this a really important source. Um, so I'm going to play the clip and then um, and wrap that wrap up. Oh yeah, I used to say, like, I have this poem that I wrote and I say, like, I grew up in Dar es Salaam because, like, everybody was Muslim. So, like, my grandmother, my uncle, right, that, my so my extended, like, sort of bio family was not. But that's not who you spent most of your time with. I mean, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother, yes, like, probably every weekend was at her house. But, like, in terms of, like, the social circles, everybody, everybody was Muslim. So, I would say I grew up in a Muslim country. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> it was like, so I remember we had this, it was Habibullah Daycare, I think it was called. And, but they had a summer camp. I remember one time we were marching. I don't know, we were walking, but like, whatever. And we were singing, like, everywhere we go, people want, we are the most close, mighty, mighty Muslim. I remember, I remember, like, you know, walking through Prosser Park or whatever, and like singing this song, Habibullah Daycare. So, why is this such a great clip? And, and why are oral histories, why am I like an oral history evangelist? Because what we get out of this story is not a deficit narrative of being Muslim in America. We get out of this story, a story of Muslim community that created and nurtured um, spaces of resilience, spaces of thriving, spaces of secure identity, um, spaces of joy, right? Um, that helps explain the, um, you know, the endurance and the long-standing resilience of these communities. Um, if we only come at the Muslim experience through headlines, if we only come at the Muslim experience through, um, you know, data points of friction, we don't get this story. And this is part of the story. And again, I'm not saying that to dismiss or diminish the very important work that we have to talk about to critique the state. And in fact, if you're familiar with Suad's work, very much a work that critiques the state. But where does that come from? It comes from this place, right? And so I think it's really important for us to reach into our histories of communities that provided this place to dream to imagine what an alternative could be than the ones we have now. And so, um, you know, I want to close out. Um, I wanted to make sure I had enough time for Q&A and conversation. Oh, before I do that, let me let me say, and, and I saw in the chat, um, Kalia um, put the link for Umi's archive. So Suad just um, this year has been rolling out a, a project called Umi's Archive, and the website is, is the linked in the chat box, where she has used 
the archive of her mother to situate the stories of her mother and her mother's communities um, in the communities of, of Brooklyn and Queens um, that tell the story of, of stories of Black women, of Black Muslim women, of Black Muslim communities. And again, it's, it's this really rich um, source of knowledge um, that can only be gained um, if we listen, right? Listening to gain knowledge, listening to create opportunities for that knowledge to speak to us and um, listening to build relationships of trust um, that nurture that knowledge. Um, and so I wanna close out with another quote and this is from Arundhati Roy and, and many people read this is another very um, memeified quote. Um, she wrote this last year in of all places, the Financial Times um, it's called The Pandemic is a Portal. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudices and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And so that is when Toni Morrison says there will always be another thing. That is the other thing I want us to focus on, um, fighting for an, a world that we imagine anew. Thank you for um, listening. Assalamu alaikum and happy to, um, engage in conversation. So I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Thank you so much, Zahir. That was absolutely amazing. Um, I want to go ahead and just jump into the questions. There was so much dialogue and conversation about your, I mean, it's, it inspired so many people to to think about different things. So I encourage you to look at the chat actually. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and start with the first question um, from Asim. For transformation, we need an objective goal or aspiration. Where do you see the vision being grounded for the Muslim community? Um, I don't know where, I mean, I think that's something collectively we would have to come up with, but um, for me, I, I would, I'm a historian, so for me, I would start it with our history, right, um, and I would look at the trajectory, uh, not, you know, not history as, as I like to say, not history as the ceiling, but history as the floor, right, history as the foundation upon which we stand, history as something that helps expand our um, you know, I guess I would say cone of possibility, right? Um, and so that's that's where I would start because I do feel that uh, in our histories of communities in the United States, um, there are many, many examples of people who have created and crafted alternatives, who have challenged the state, who have um, imagined, um, you know, what uh, ideal would look like, um, who have helped further the conversation on justice. You know, so like I think about like the work of say um, a good friend and colleague of mine, Garrett Felber, who, who, who wrote this book called um, Those Who Say Don't Know. And he talks, and it's about the nation of Islam's history in fighting um, the carceral state. And if you look around the conversation around the carceral state, the literature, you know, people like Heather Thompson and Elizabeth Hinton, the people who are like getting lots of shine, um, you would not know that Muslims have been very much involved in this fight from the earliest of days, right? And, and have been involved in this fight in really unique ways. Um, not only have been responsible for landmark cases um, in terms of the legal system, but have also been responsible for imagining um, what would lead to the vision of prison abolition, right? And so that's in our tradition. That's in our history. If we would just listen to the stories, if we, and I say listen as like broad, not just auditory, but if we would just pay attention to the histories that we have. And so that's just one example. Another example is the conversations around um, environmental sustainability, permaculture and food justice. 
there's like a whole history of like Muslims farming and, you know, wanting to own land and create co-ops and providing, you know, farm to table food, you know, like we have that now it's not to again not to repeat that not to say let's go try to do that again because that occurred in a very specific historic context that context that not does not exist but again history not as the ceiling but as the foundation thank you so much i this question um from abbas can you say more about non-deficit based narrative yes um <sighs> I love that question. Um, so when I say non deficit you know, so much of the, so a deficit narrative is about how, how much we've been harmed. Mm -hmm. And we have been harmed, right? Like we have been attacked, we have been brutalized, we have been policed, we have been surveilled. Um, and so you have to walk this, this balance between um, highlighting the oppressiveness of systems while at the same time not dehumanizing the people who are in those systems, right? So that I fundamentally believe that we have still retained our humanity. And sometimes that belief is tested, but I fundamentally believe that we have retained our humanity. And the way that we do that um, is by highlighting the, the ways that that has been done the stories of resilience, the stories of survival, the stories of joy, the stories of culture creation, um, that our time in the United States, whether as the experience of enslaved people and the descendants of enslaved people or immigrants and the descendants of immigrants is has not just been that of some like inanimate object being kicked around the field like a soccer ball. We have created, we have contributed, we have transformed, we have generated, not just for ourselves, but for the society at large. So that is moving from a deficit narrative to one one of abundance, one of con I don't want to, I don't like saying contribution because it's you know like I don't want to get into like contribution and transactional, but one of I say transformation and resilience. Great, thank you. Um, so another question that's somewhat related, but I think you can expand on um, what you said. What do you see as the role of joy and celebration in the knowledge that we produce? I love the sound of Dr. Swad laughing. <laughs> um, and I'd love to hear more about, about that. And that's from Mona Hagemagad. Uh, thank you so much. I, I also love the sound of, of Swad. <laughs> you know, it's, it's such a, it's, you know, like I said, she was a little self-conscious and I actually had to fight with Swad um, to let me release that audio unedited because there's so many giggles in, in her <laughs> storytelling. But look, um, <sighs> you know, from a practical perspective in terms of doing movement work, um, you know, and, and I think we all are doing movement work in, in one way or another. Like we have to, if, if you just, you have to balance it, right? Like you, you did, like you can't just, I mean, it, it starts to wear you down um, when you, all you read are story, you know, like doom scrolling, like it, it the joy is, so joy is part of like wellness, right? So just like part of wellness in the work that we do, like it is absolutely necessary. But joy is also like, it's like a portal that opens up to learn about family relations, to learn about networks, to learn about the resources that people created, to learn about um, not just the ways that people coped with adversity, but to learn about the ways people over, I don't wanna say overcame, but triumphed over adversity. Learn about the, the, the sort of psychic, emotional, and um, sociological weapons that people formed to counter um, you know, harmful narratives and actions. Um, joy is not just affect, right? It's not just emotion, but it is very much a tool in the work um, that people are doing. Okay, wonderful. And this probably will be the last question um, from Dr. Matson. I believe we have a tremendous opportunity to use oral history methods to engage with elders in our community. We can learn resilience from them, show honor and respect to them and strengthen our mutual relationship with these methods and practices. But we would need to a way to train amateur oral historians across the community. 
Um, and how can we do that? Well, <laughs> that's just a perfect question. Um, actually, the work that I'm doing um, with my fellowship at the Open Society Foundation, my Source Equality Fellowship, is to develop a um, capacity building oral history um, program. So I would just like invite you to get in touch with me because um, the idea is to train people in our communities to do historical preservation work. Um, you know, one of the things that's really important is that there is so much knowledge that is, you know, that is locked up in people in their lives that they haven't been asked, but also people's collections, people's private collections. Um, our stories are, are, are woefully incomplete because we don't have the material culture. Um, we don't have the oral history um, to tell these stories. You know, you, 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 you go to like, a, like an established church, there's like a church history and they can take you back to the church founding, right? And they have all of the records and they make that available to researchers, right? Now, for people who do historical research, we depend on the archives. If the archives aren't there, well, I can't tell the story. I can't make it up, right? Mm -hmm. so, so not only do we need to focus on this interpretive work of like, you know, making these, you know, the, the sort of fashioning arguments with the data that we have, but we also have to focus on creating the archive. Right, the archive, not just for the work that we're doing today, but the work that will be done for generations. One of the things I'm really proud of with the Muslims in Brooklyn project is that the archive of those 55 oral histories we did are their archive at Brooklyn Historical Society, which has been around for 150 some odd years, and inshallah will be around for that much longer or even longer. And it's those interviews are now online, they're fully transcribed, the transcripts are searchable, the audio is synced to the transcripts. That is an archive, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just like you do your research interview and you keep it in your personal, you know, because. Look, we're also part of market competitiveness and people are like, I gotta get my thing out. I gotta get my article in. I gotta get my book in. I gotta get my grant funded. Um, but at some point we're gonna have to provide the research that we have done to the broader community. And that's why I'm talking about community-based participatory work that empowers our communities to engage in historic preservation work. Because without that history, we, we're already five or six generations deep right? Um, and we are scrambling. We are literally scrambling to collect those stories, right? That's why up until like, I would say the early 2000s, if you read a book or an article about Muslim history in the United States, they said the same thing. They cited the same three books. They cited the same sources. There was no new knowledge. There was no new interpretation. There was no new data. That is our job, right? But we have to work with communities who are rightfully and justifiably deeply suspicious of mercenary scholars who go in and take people and extract people's information, extract people's knowledge, extract, extract people's history, make a career for themselves and the community is like left with nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And so on the other hand, we have people who are, you know, privately hoarding personal papers and it's like, oh my God, like we really have to come with, a, we have to come up with a way to work with, um, you know, untrained, unconventional, uninstitutional scholars community scholars, we, you know, you know, people who are like, I've collected all of this stuff, who need just a little help training. Um, like, I, I am completely open for us. And I hope one of the things that comes out of this gathering is we do think about what is the historic preservation work that we have to do. Um, you know, do we need to set up digitization days, you know, like history days at a community center, at a mosque, let people bring their photographs and flyers and newsletters and digitize it. And like the deal is you agree for this to go into an archive and you also keep it too, right? But you let us put it in the archive because it is going to shape the narrative going into the future. That is how you change the narrative by changing the data sources that people are using to construct um, those stories. I can go on and on, but I, I, I thank you for that question. I do hope 
Um, I consider historic preservation a justice issue, a social justice issue. Um, the way that you erase people, and we've seen this around the world, is by erasing their history. And, and so we really have to counter the erasure of our history in the United States. Um, and we do that by recovering those stories through oral history, through material culture. I'm going to plug two more things. Um, I was, as, as Adalia said, I'm a history editor at Sapelo Square. Um, during February for Black History Month, we worked with the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of African American History and Culture to highlight objects in their collection that told the stories of Muslim communities. And some of these were obvious like prayer rugs and prayer beads. And some of them were not so obvious that they didn't even have categorized as Muslim like Rockham's microphone or Art Blakey's drumsticks or the tape recorder that Malcolm X used at Moss number seven, right? These, these are the things that help tell the stories that not only tell the stories in like a sort of exotic ways, like when people are like, oh, well, the Muslims, we got to see them praying, they get prayer artifacts. But no, like there was like an egg carton from like a Muslim farm that was part of this story. And so I think we only get that fuller picture, that fuller nuanced story of Muslims in the United States um, by engaging all of these sources. Oral history is absolutely one of them. Material culture is another. And working with communities to make sure people are comfortable in sharing their stories and sharing their objects and sharing their items in ways that uplift them and uplift all of us. Thank you so much. Uh, this was amazing. Um, I wish we could all clap, but we're, we're, all, we're all clapping for you. This, this was truly, truly amazing. And I think I speak for everyone when I say that.